I haven't seen anybody join in a minute or two, so um, so let's go ahead and get started. And and I'd like to welcome um, all all of our Native Plant Society members and friends. Um, my name is Connie Mamel, and I'm I'm the chair of the Wenatchee Valley chapter. And this will be um, our chapter's last webinar for the month of April, which is Native Plant Appreciation Month. Uh, but we, there is one more uh, webinar that will be held by our society, and that's a statewide presentation. That will be this Thursday night, and uh, it should be really interesting. It will be on the plants of the Washington-Idaho border. So if you'll check out the website for Thursday night, um, that, that should be a really good one. So um, what we have coming up in June are a number of really interesting hikes for the Wenatchee Valley. We've got hikes in various places in, in our chapters area, Chelan County, uh, nine of them. And they vary quite a bit in ecology and, and also in length. So if check out the website and see what we've got coming up in the next couple of months. I think, I think you'll see that there's something for pretty much everybody. And I hope you'll be able to join us um, on one or more of those hikes. So um, that, that's really all I have for update uh, tonight. So I'm gonna turn this over to our, our chapter's membership coordinator, Emily Orling. And Emily will introduce our speaker for tonight. Thanks, Connie. Um, so this evening, uh, our speaker is going to be Kelly Barabar, and I did just have her bio open, and now it's closed. So <laughs> there it is. Um, so Kelly Barabar is the district botanist on the Methow Valley Ranger District in Winthrop. Uh, Kelly's career with the Forest Service began nearly 25 years ago as a wildland firefighter. She spent the summer fighting fire while saving money to travel the world in the winter months. When she grew weary of rappelling out of helicopters, Kelly decided to hit the books and complete her degree at the University of Washington. Kelly was in the last graduating class at UW to earn a degree strictly dedicated to botany. Um, soon after graduation, she was offered a permanent position on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest. Her first job as a permanent employee was to was spent between the Wenatchee River Ranger District and the Methow Valley Ranger District. Um, after one summer season, she transferred to Okanagan to work with the Forest Service Ecology Program. And then in 2010, she accepted the district botanist position on the Methow Valley Ranger District. Kelly enjoys paddle boarding with her three adorable daughters down the Methow River in the summer. And she enjoys skiing as much as she can in the winter. Uh, Kelly's favorite native plant is Calicortis lyallii, <laughs> which is a really, really lovely one. Um, and without further ado, um, Kelly, we're ready for your presentation. All right, thank you, Emily. Uh, there'll be two uh, PowerPoints this evening. Uh, the first PowerPoint will cover um, the Heather restoration project that occurred on Highway 20 up here in, in the North Cascades on the Methow District. Uh, we'll talk about the plant propagation efforts that went into that, education uh, of users that is ongoing, and public involvement in that, um, that project. The second PowerPoint will go into Heather Ecology. Adapts, adaptation strategies of Heather, colonization strategies, tolerance to disturbance, and finally climate change. Hey Kelly, this is Emily. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I forgot a super important part of my introduction. Um, and that is just an invitation uh, for any, 
anybody in the audience to ask questions for Kelly. Um, if people have have a question, they are welcome to use the Q&A box that is located at the bottom of their Zoom screen. And then we will make some time at the end of the presentation for Kelly to answer some questions. Um, okay, sorry, thank you. Okay, so um, the Meho Ranger District was approached by the uh, National Forest Foundation. Actually, uh, we were asked to apply for um, um, the Treasured Landscape Campaign through the National Forest Foundation. And um, the, their mission was is to bring people together to restore and enhance uh, national forests and grasslands. And the uh, National Forest Foundation can also um, raise private funds to help restore public lands. So in 2012, around there, the Met Howe um, Valley Ranger District applied to be a treasured landscape to the um, National Forest Foundation. The district's application was selected in 2013. And from there, the district went through um, a series of reviews to identify unique areas that we thought um, could use some restoration efforts. Uh, the Forest Service and National Forest Foundation um, and the personnel work together um, to develop plans uh, to support key forest conservation projects. And pro the projects could include um, recreation enhancement, meadow restoration, um, subalpine uh, community restoration, um, just a whole gamut of, of projects that could, could occur through that campaign. So again, the campaign's vision um, is to restore lands and raise awareness um, and also to support long-term uh, stewardship. So the um, METHAO became the majestic METHAO through the campa campaign. Uh, Maple Loop was an area that um, was, was given um, specific attention because of the uh, restoration needs um, that were needed to occur due to high uh, recreational use and the impacts that, that those uses were having on the subalpine plant community. Blue Lake was also included uh, in, in the um, restoration efforts. So just to give you an idea, sorry, this map is kind of distorted, um, just to give you a, an idea of where, um, the project, let's see, I'm trying to get my point here. So um, this is Maple Loop here. It's right off of Highway 20. So um, it's really easily accessible from the west side. Um, and that's what makes this, this hike so attractive, um, as well as Blue Lake, is that it's, a, you know, it's a hop, skip, and a jump from um, some areas in Seattle and uh, scenic views. Um, relatively short in distance. A little bit on the trail history. Um, uh, it's, it's unknown when the trail to Lake Ann and up to Maple Pass was actually created, but um, we do know that in, 19, uh, in 1890s, the Washington Forest Reserve was created. In the 1930s, the, the area where the trail is now was um, considered by the YMCA for inclusion in the PCT. And by the 1960s, the trail to Lake Ann appears on, on maps. Um, and then in the 1980s, the trail to Heather Pass appears on Forest Service maps. The trail is right on the boundary between the um, National Forest Service and the um, Park Service, but it's full, fully on um, Forest Service land. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, so throughout the 1980s, um, proposals um, continued to go through to try to get a trail to full, do a full loop. And in 1993, the Okanagan National Forest secured funding to complete the loop. Um, and it was completed in two months over a single summer. And if any of you have hiked that loop, that's quite an accomplishment. Um, it was mainly um, uh, individuals in their late teens that completed the loop and, and it took 11 people to do it. So they were working hard all summer. 
and the loop full, fully opened in the fall of 1993. Today, it's one of the most popular trails on the forest. Um, back in 1993, around there, it was just a local trail that, that locals um, discovered and used. This is why the loop is, is so popular. Um, scenic views are um, abundant and um, you can have 360 degree uh, views once you get up on top. This is Lake Anne in the bottom. I mean, the trail that you see there on the, in the left is, is a trail coming up um, uh, from the, uh, it's counterclockwise or clockwise. Just some more views of, of the hike. And this is a wing lake off of um, Heather Pass um, with Black Peak in the background, a popular climbing area. Oh, I was going to um, show you that down, there's a saddle um, down in here. This is where Heather Pass is. Um, and then the trail coming up the side is going up to Maple Pass. So the project history, um, maybe some of you recognize the individuals in the photos and maybe one of them is on the call tonight, I don't know. Uh, many years ago, Therese Olson, at the time was the district botanist, became very concerned about the erosive effects of the foot traffic at, on Maple Pass. And Teresa got in touch, um, or Therese got in touch with um, Regina Roqueford, the plant ecologist at the park at the time. And they collaborated on the grants, um, and, but were denied because there were two federal agencies involved in funding and needed to be matched from a private source to get grants. Um, so the, I, the idea was to get funding for restoration, propagation, and education. So that was put on hold. Um, over the years, um, it became more and more obvious um, that as Therese would put it, the area was falling apart. The National Park Service was still wanting to, um, to help in restoration efforts because although the trail was entirely on Forest Service lands, people were hiking into the park to get views. Um, in 2013, we started to get funding and um, from private donors. And this is one of our interns from the North Cascades Institute near Marble Mount that was assigned to the project. Uh, she would snowshoe up, this is, her name was Chelsea Ernst, and she would snowshoe up in um, the late spring uh, to see how much snow fall pack was left and how that snow pack, the residual snow pack was influencing where hikers would go. Uh, project partners for the restoration, um, again, was the National Forest Foundation. Uh, the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest offered um, their personnel to write all the NEPA documents involved to get the restoration uh, projects going and supplied the personnel hours. The National Park uh, Service also um, helped immensely with um, plant propagation. And uh, then the North Cascades Institute uh, offered interns to, to help with the project and lead um, public engagement. REI um, got to be one of the um, bigger uh, project sponsors along with Moccasin Lake up here in the Met Howe, as well as a handful of ind individual supporters. Uh, project contractors, we were given funds for um, to fund uh, local contractors. So Therese graciously um, volunteered to be a contract to help lead the restoration areas or the restoration efforts and help uh, design areas that would be roped off. And then met how natives provided um, a plants and uh, helped with the restoration area at Blue Lake immensely. So just some photos of what was going on. Um, Heather, this is Heather Pass and there's a double trail that um, was created. And um, it was mainly created because um, hikers that were trying to access Black Peak in the background there to climb, uh, would go in in early summer and that uh, main trail would get slippery and mucky. And, um, and so folks would travel on that up the hillside of the trail to, to get better footing. Just another picture of, um, of that early 
summer. Um, these are the following pictures are just areas of the disturbed areas where uh, they were roped off. So this is these are some of the braided trails that um, folks were creating as they were looking for viewpoints. They're just trying to get space. Um, there are upwards of 10,000 people that um, hike the trail every summer. So space is an issue. Now, this is one of the viewpoints. Um, and we were really cognizant about trying to um, leave viewpoints available um, that, that weren't roped off because myself as a hiker, I like to go over and peek over the edge. So we knew that the roping off everything was not going to work. So this is one of the areas that has remained open as a viewpoint. Um, a picture of um, an illegal campsite at um, Heather Pass. And I'll be showing an after photo of this shortly. And then just a view from um, climbing up towards Maple, or Maple Pass, um, looking down on Heather Pass and some of the braided trails. So the restoration efforts begin. Uh, we've we've roped off um, quite a number of areas and have put uh, restoration signs to just educate folks um, what can happen when when these community plant when the individual plants are um, trampled on. Again, our NCI um, intern here installing the ropes and the stakes. So this is the before and after picture at Heather Pass. Uh, there were, um, we put some organic material in the trail to help connect the, um, the um, plants on either side. So when the soil is exposed, it's harder for the plants to reach across and grow within areas that have been impacted. So we put some organic era, um, material to help um, with that recovery, as well as some stepping stones to um, help folks step on something um, other than muck as they're trying to get through the trail. And more stepping stones were added later to this particular stretch. This is the campsite. Um, I showed you earlier, and uh, we just turned it into a viewpoint. It, it's um, it's an area that uh, folks like to, again, pop over the edge and, and look down and see what's on the other side. So we uh, lined it and uh, planted some shrubs on either side. But it did turn out um, of, of folks that wanted to join in and help. We had um, the ski team from the Met Howe. The Nordic ski team come and help out um, tall rock and materials up top and um, just a handful of, of local people that um, just showed up and were eager to help. Uh, so there were some footbridges on the way up to Heather Pass, Heather Maple Pass that were replaced through this effort and, um, and trail brushing that occurred as well. Plant propagation. So uh, the collection and growing out of native plants um, occurred through the, um, the greenhouse in Marble Mount. Um, Stacy is the, uh, McDonough is the NPS aquaculturist and her team went out to collect um, cuttings and it was super important that we got genetically um, uh, appropriate material for this effort since it, it is going into pretty sensitive area. And that's Stacy again, um, collecting cuttings to put in the nursery. This effort was pretty tricky because Stacy um, was a seasonal employee, so trying to get trying to accomplish um, you know, nine months worth of work in, in a matter of six months was, was tricky for Stacy. Plants um, taken here to the nursery and um, 
laid in flats. I believe this is uh, Vaccinium deliciosum. Part of the public involvement um, included getting Gonzaga students to come to the greenhouse and weed the little huckleberry starts. It was quite entertaining to watch. Um, they had fun. And this is just um, some of the, the um, material that was clipped and, and planted back in. So white heather, black sedge. Um, black sedge holds up to foot traffic um, pretty well. Pink heather, um, pussy toes, mountain ash, subalpine huckle, um, huckleberry, and partridge foot. So after plants were grown out in the nursery, they were um, brought to the smoke jumper base in Winthrop and we um, carefully took them out of the conta their containers and put them in plastic bags, put them in cargo boxes. Um, we, we bundled up all of our supplies and um, in the planting tools into big um, heavy bags and they were slung into the um, project area along with the plants. And this is a picture of volunteers on planting day. We had fun. So education, this, um, this um, verbiage is on the, some of the education signs along the trail, uh, just to inform folks of, of what, um, how sensitive these um, Heather communities are. Uh, one of our key messages was that it takes less than 20 foot steps to, um, to kill a heather plant just because the, uh, the trampling um, effects of breaking down the stems. Um, maps were also handed out um, at the trailhead to help uh, folks identify where they were on the trail, as well as alpine ecology and restoration brochures. Our intern Chelsea GPS the trail and uh, put it on a, a map and included it in the brochure. Part of the problem was um, there were no um, or limited trail signs, so we were able to get trail signs up to give folks an idea of where they were going, and and so they're they'd be less likely to develop their own trails. Public engagement. We had a host of project volunteers. Uh, I believe there were four or five um, uh, individual projects that went on to um, help with this or to, that went into this um, restoration project. And citizen science, uh, we encouraged folks to um, monitor the area and take pictures of um, of any disturbance that was going on that um, was greater than what we had seen initially. Um, we are taking um, yearly photo points or, or by yearly photo points of the area that was planted. And just a key message about restoration, um, this will take dec decades to reestablish. Um, some of these plants don't mature enough to set their first blooms until they are about 25 years old. So just, uh, you know, if you hike the loop and you're not seeing results as I am as quickly as I want to, I just need to keep that in mind that these subalpine areas do require a much longer time to, to uh, reestablish and rehab. Okay, Denise, I might need your help to get to the second slideshow. Here. Say that again, Kelly. I think I heard my name. I, uh, I just going to, hi. Yeah, I'm just pulling up the second slide um, PowerPoint and um, was thinking that I might need assistance with that. But um, okay, so okay. you're going to want to stop share. If you go up here, stop share. Now open your second PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and completely stop sharing. And then your second PowerPoint should be open on your desktop before you share again. 
Okay, it is open. All right, go ahead and share screen. And select the window that has that presentation. Okay, so. And then that presentation down in the tray, mm -hmm. that slideshow button, there you go. Okay, and then I think I need to swap. Yes, go up to display settings at the top. Display settings up at the top. Okay. And open that menu. Display settings. I'm not sure I'm seeing that. Um, I'll go up higher. No, one more over. One more over. Okay. Oh, I wish I could click it for you. Just move your cursor to the right <laughs> and <laughs> click. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you move your cursor to the right? Move into the right. It's not moving. Why? There we go. Oh, now you got to come back over to the left. Okay, remote control. <laughs> so you can't see where it says display settings? No, I saw it when we were setting up before, but I don't see it now. Um, I, Cause I can see it and I'm looking at your screen. So okay. just come yeah. down a little bit and click. Okay. With your cursor, just a little bit and click. Okay. Oh, that's my cursor. Um, all right, come down here underneath your first slide that says Heather. And uh -huh. uh, click on the screen right there. And let's try it that way. Okay. I wonder yeah, if there. It's... Yeah. No. 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 Okay. Click again. And then how about this over this other one? Two to the left. There. No, we don't. Want that. Click the three dots. Uh hmm. yeah, click that. No, no. No. I don't understand why you can't see this because I can see. All right. Now, can you see display settings at the top? No, there's above, a bunch of above your slide. Okay. So you can't so you see can't this tool bar at all? Mm -mm. Maybe I'll stop sharing and. Um, I'll get, okay, let me try something here. All right. Okay. Yeah, it was it was actually covered up, but now I can't. Okay. Can you see my screen now? You have to share your screen again. Okay. Beautiful. Okay, I'm not seeing, sorry about this. I'm not seeing my slides though. So let's see here. Hmm. I'm just gonna. Okay, I think if I can somehow get back in here and share my screen now, we will be good. 
Okay, how does that look? Beautiful. Okay, thank you for your patience. All right, thank you. Right. Heather uh, Ecology. Um, if anybody wants to try and uh, put in the chat, um, try to name off these four species. Um, four heather species. So there's um, pink mountain heather down here in the lower right, Philodice uh, and Petroformis. And then moving up um, to the top right is the white mountain. Um, Heather, white moss heather, Cassiope mertensiana. And the middle picture there is the hybrid of Philodice intermedia. And then um, the uh, yellow mountain heather, um, Philodice glanduliflora. Oh boy. Are you seeing the slide change on your end? Emily or Denise, are you seeing the slide change? Hey, Kelly, no. Uh, it doesn't look like we're seeing the slide change. OK. Is it changing on your end? It's changing on my end. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, Technology. So yeah. What we might have to do is, um, you might just have to see my notes if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. If um, if if that's what we need to do, then that that'll work perfectly fine as well. Okay. So I stopped sharing. Okay. And then, um, oh, are you seeing anything there? Um, not quite yet. Uh, I think you still need to share your screen. Yeah. What about there? Did you see the slide change? Okay, yeah, so your screen is sharing now, and we are looking at a slide that says Heather Overview. Great, so let's see if this, just keep rolling and see if this works. So, All right. um, few random, we'll go over a few random facts about Heather. Uh, species distribution. It must be a setting thing. Because it's not changing on your end, I can't, yeah. Okay. Are you just going? Yeah, let's just um let's just look at your notes if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. And then while Kelly's bringing up her slideshow, just a uh, reminder to attendees that if you have any questions, you can enter them into the Q&A. We have a couple and we will get to those and then any extra questions at the end. Okay. So I am going to try to um, we'll try this one more time just because I think it needs to happen. Okay, sounds good. Okay, how's that working? Uh, you know, we can see we you know this is gonna work just fine. Let's let's go with this. <laughs> <laughs> you sound hesitant. Okay, so you can, you can see the the dual screens then. We can see one screen that we could see the ribbon on the side with all the slides and then uh, the slide is kind of smallish and then there's a click to add notes at the bottom. Okay. So I'm not sure if we're looking at the presenter side or not, but either way, this is, 
this is going to work. We can, read, okay. we can read things, so that's fine. All right. All right. So uh, we'll go over a few random facts, uh, species distribution, uh, characteristics, colonization strategies, plant adaptations, um, uh, community composition, uh, tolerance to disturbance, and finally uh, climate change. Uh, so heather species, uh, heathers belong to the family uh, Aracaceae. They occur within the upper montane and subalpine zones um, from 5,200 to 7,200 feet. They enjoy shallow acidic soils. Uh, they are perennials that flower uh, between July and August. And um, they're pollinated by bumblebees and bumblebee bees have a certain amount of species fidelity because they want to pollinate, um, they want to get um, pollen from one plant um, to the other uh, plant of the same species. Um, and so heather grow in um, moist to well-drained acidic soils uh, where snow gives way to um, protection. Um, but also um, where snow gives some protection, but also um, melts early. Hey, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Um, we are still looking at the first slide. I wonder what would happen if you double click on the slide that you are wanting to look at. How about that? No, we're still looking at your old one, the first slide. Does this change anything for you? No. Would you try moving your mouse around? Yeah, it's moving. OK, so I think we're looking at a different screen than you are. Is your presentation open someplace else? No. OK. Um, yeah, let's let's try sharing it again, maybe. Okay. How's that? Okay, let's try advancing to your next slide. If you click on slide two. Can you see that? Okay, now we're looking at slide two. Okay, great. Yes, I think we're good to go. So I think you were maybe on slide three oh, or so slide four okay. when I rudely interrupted. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, Kelly. there we go. Okay. <laughs> Mountain slopes where heather occurs are uh, typically remain snow covered from mid October until late June. And local topography has an important influence on heather species distribution and community composition uh, because it de determines both the winter and summer moisture regimes. So microclimates, um, Heather occur within um, these uh, three bands in the North Cascades, um, East, Central, and West. And solar radiation can play a big role in um, where the species will occur. Um, temperature as well, um, precip and wind. So each of these, uh, the solar radiation, the temperature, and the precip plus the wind are different as you move from West to East. Distribution of Pink Mountain Heather, um, it occurs from Alaska, from the Yukon Territory down um, through BC and Washington over to the Rockies and down to California. Uh, Pink Mountain Heather um, enjoys soils that are most moist to dry. It likes uh, um, open forest rocky ridges and fell fields. It, it is of the three species, it clearly dominates the lower um, subalpine sites, uh, but its posi position is quickly taken over by um, white moss heather in, and um, Philodice grandiloflora in higher elevational zones. Distribution of um, moss heather, it occurs from Alaska to California and east to the Rocky Mountains to Nevada. It, um, 
Its habitat it, is mostly upper montane to alpine zones. And it, it dominates where there's um, continuous percolation from upslope snow patches, um, which occur in high moisture levels throughout the um, in areas throughout the summer. It can occur at higher elevations than the yellow mountain heather in wetter and warmer sites. Distribution of the oops, yellow mountain heather, um, it's found from Alaska to California and east of the Rockies. Um, in the Western North Cascades, it prefers the more exposed upper slopes. And in the Eastern Cascades, it typically occurs in more protected habitats. Of the three species, um, Philodicea glandulaflora dominates the most exposed and drier ends of the topographic gradient. And it usually emerges from snow, um, snow cover a few days earlier than the more mesic and uh, sheltered areas where the um, Western moss heather and the pink mountain heather occur. And this is the, the hybrid mix here. Um, and it usually occurs where um, Philodicea and Pepperfrost um, and Glandulaflora occur together. It's, um, it's a first generation uh, sterile species. Characteristics of um, the uh, pink mountain heather. Uh, pink flowers, obviously. Um, the flowers are not glandular, uh, glandular at all. They don't have the glandular hairs that the other species do. And the um, lobes of the petals are recurved and spreading. And when we talk about um, um, survival strategies, we'll talk about why the um, rolled in leaves are important in this species. Um, characteristics of the white mountain heather, instead of having the needle-like uh, leaves, this species has the, um, the, the overlapping uh, leaves. It has a red uh, stalk. Yellow mountain heather, um, and this species has the glandular hairs. It has um, urn-shaped flowers that are not recurved, as in Philodicea and Petroformis. And this is the sterile species, um, the intermedia. And it, as you would think, carries um, characteristics from both Philodicea and Petroformis and the glandula flora. So it has the urn-shaped flowers of the glandular flora as well as the glandular hairs but carry some of the, um, the um, flower color characteristics from impetriformis. And we'll go into um, colonization strategies. Uh, so subalpine communities um, like heather are usually developed from bare rock or soil on um, areas that have been recently exposed from glaciers. And the heather um, community types are usually the, um, occur on the most recently exposed habitats. They are thought to, believe it or not, be pioneer species. And heather seedlings require um, high soil moisture con content to, um, in order to colonize. And so you will find this on bare soil where the um, soil has a low hydrophobicity, which means that um, water can penetrate it more easily and not run off. And that allows for the um, heather seedlings to establish in these areas. In more mature heather communities, the organic material is going to um, make the soil more hydrophobic. And so heather seedlings are less likely to be able to establish immature heather communities because of that hydrophobic soil. This is just a really cool graphic um, from a book written by Ola uh, Marjorie uh, Edwards. And it shows the, uh, the stages of, uh, of heather community growth. And you have the initiation phase where heather seedlings are, um, are starting to establish in areas that uh, downslope from snow melt off within um, rocks 
where the moisture is held. And then the 100, 100 year phase where there's a fine layer of um, textures uh, from soils that have accumulated amongst the rocks and the um, seedlings are, are um, able to grow from there. And they also had, uh, have adventitious root systems that allow them to spread out and start forming mat, mats. And then um, getting to the 7,000 to 10,000 year phase is where there is a hefty mat established by the Heather community. It's mature. Um, So the initiation, uh, initiation phase, um, soils are uh, well developed by gradual wind and water, waterborne accumulation rather than the weathering of the plant materials. So the, the, the wind and water bring the soil in. Um, soil is stabilized by um, cryptogamic soils, which are composed of mosses and crestose lichens. And these soils work really well at stabilizing against continuous wind and meltwater erosion. Uh, seedlings are extremely small and slow growing and have shallow roots that require t uh, the continuous surface moisture. And, and that's where those hydrophobic, um, those low hydrophobic soils come in. And distribution is correlated with the placement of surface stones. And this is just a picture of the um, cryptobiotic soil here. And they work to um, fix uh, nutrients and trap soil as well as seeds and modify um, temperature and, and uh, moisture. This is the colonization phase, the 100 year phase. And it's marked um, when a layer of fine textured soil has accumulated. And you can notice where the heather are, are um, starting to grow and it's amongst those rocks uh, where the moisture is trapped. The develop phase, development phase. Um, so centuries are required to, to get to this phase. Um, mature uh, heather communities can take uh, 7,000 to 10,000 years to form. Carbon, carbon dating, this is, this, I found this really fascinating. Carbon dating on uh, buried stems at sites on Mount Rainier confirmed the age of some of these heather communities to be more than 10,000 years old. So um, these ecosystems, um, plant communities in the subalpine area are constantly pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. Um, and and they, they are having to do this because of the stressful environments in which they live. Uh, and one of the ways they are able to do this is through the mycorrhizal association in the soil. And mycorrhizal are its fungi, fungi that attaches itself to the roots of these plants and um, helps uh, with the growth, growth rates, protects the plant from pathogens, and accelerates the, um, the water and soil movement. It's a, a mutualistic and maybe slightly um, parasitic uh, relationship, but it's beneficial. Um, in a single uh, teaspoon of soil, there are, um, there's enough mycorrhizal bands that if you laid them end to end, um, they would run from Mount Rainier a National Park to Seattle and back. The plant adaptations of um, heather communities. Uh, most plants are perennials. They have deep, strong roots. Um, they grow in low mats and cushions and covered in silky hairs, and that helps uh, keep them warm in the winter and protect them from solar radiation in the summer. Uh, the thick waxy leaves help with water retention. One of the other plant ad adaptations in um, subalpine plant um, communities is the anthocyanin um, pigment. It's the red pigment that you see on some plants and um, they are, it's a product of carbohydrates stored in the roots from the previous growing season. And um, these pigments convert light rays in, um, into heat that warm the plant tissues. Uh, 
and they can also act as sunscreen. Survival strategies, heather are evergreens and they don't lose their uh, leaves, which is advantageous, advantageous in harsh um, environments. It allows for lower photosynthesis and uh, respiration rates. And uh, this requires less energy um, in, in order to survive. Um, the older plants provide important storage of plant uh, reserves. And the um, conifer-like needles um, are, have less uh, surface area, which decreases the amount of water that can um, evaporate. So there you can see the needle-like leaves with the decreased surface area. Um, and the, the um, fuller, fuller water absorption from cloud or fog is a significant factor in sustaining heather communities because um, of the, uh, the high um, periods of drought in the soil in the summer. Uh, dense hairs on the stems of um, the yellow mountain heather and the white moss heather protect them from cold winds and um, temperatures. And they can also protect them from uh, insects that are trying to suck uh, liquid out of the stems or other plant parts. Stemmata. Stemmata are pores in the outer layer of leaves and stem, stems and other organs. And it's used as gas exchange. Air containing carbon dioxide and oxygen enters the plant through these openings and is used in photosynthesis and respiration. So some species of um, heather have good control over their water loss through the stomata and some don't have as good of control and that will dictate where they are um, in where they can uh, um, survive in habitats. Uh, so all three species um, can occur at any habitat, but yeah, like I said, it, it depends on how well they can control their stomata openings. The um, pink mountain heather has better control of water loss from leaves. Uh, that's why it can occur in lower and warmer uh, sites within the subalpine, subalpine region. Um, but it doesn't have as good of control, um, it, 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 but, it out, but it is not able to take in cold water very well. It can't, um, it can't handle that cold water intake um, from the stomata, which is why, again, it, it, it's not dominating at higher, um, at higher elevations. It's those, higher, um, those lower temperature, excuse me, higher temperatures and high, higher soil moist, moisture temperatures. The white mountain heather um, is it's uh, it, it's very susceptible to um, lethal cold um, desiccation because of its decreased ability to control water loss at cold temperatures, and it will also dominate uh, at warmer, drier sites and at uh, higher elevations because it um, can absorb cold water um, much better than Philodice um, and Petroformis, the pink mountain heather. Um, the yellow mountain heather has good control over its uh, leaf water loss, uh, which explains why it can dominate in arid habitats um, with um, cold soil temperatures. It can, it's also very good at, at absorbing cold water. And so again, these are the three bands in which um, the heather communities will be found from east to west. So most of the subalpine and alpine um, community types in eastern North Cascades are closely related to those of the Rocky Mountains in southern Alaska, whereas communities in um, the western North Cascades are similar to communities um, in the other west coast ranges. Um, typical communities of the dwarf uh, shrub uh, heather, uh, mountain heather type. Um, this type is found in sites that appear to be quite similar to those of the white mountain heather or white moss heather, um, at least in the Western and Central Cascades.
Some common associates of the mountain heather can be include um, the Antonera lanata, the woolly pussy toes, and grouse berry, uh, Vaccinium scoparium. In, um, as in later successional stages, trees begin to encroach into the heather communities. Um, typical community of the white mountain heather. Um, it's most common in the Western um, Cascades and it, it ranges east to the Slate Peak and Glacial Peak, er the Glacier Peak areas. Some common associates are partridge foot, uh, woolly pussy toes and cascade blueberry. Typical community of the yellow mountain heather um, floristically, uh, Philodice glandulophora is the richest in, in community. Um, it occurs again on exposed upper slopes in the western part of the region and more protected habitats in the central and eastern region. Common associates are the cascade willow, uh, cascade blueberry, and woolly pussy toes. So um, tolerance of heather communities to disturbance. Um, and this is Blue Lake, another one of the areas that um, was restored. Heather is readily susceptible to damage and trampling. Um, trampling has initiated and accelerated erosion of some heather soils that have taken up to 7,000 years uh, to accumulate. And centuries are required to develop the soil again um, and get that organic material in place for the heather to begin to um, establish. So the litter layer of these um, disturbed areas is disrupted and needle ice um, in the winter can cause more erosion to occur and it can um, the, the adult um, heather plants are no longer um, allowed to maintain their hold on the erosion once that phase sets in. So exposed ridges are tricky um, because these are areas that tend to hold on to um, snow fields later into the hiking season. And um, this is where hikers will tend to want to go off trail and um, create user created uh, user created trails. Um, so slope angle will determine um, how some of these uh, habitats are uh, affected by disturbance. And um, as I said before, the disturbance is accentuated during the spring um, melt-off period when islands of vegetation first become snow-free. Um, the soil is frozen. At this time, the plants are still dormant and susceptible to damage. Um, and groups are drawn to these isolated areas to start rock climbing um, in the areas of Heather and Maple Pass. Uh, Heather response to fires. Uh, Jim Agee and Laura Podash, who uh, is a retired forest botanist, studied the um, effects of uh, fire on subalpine sites um, through experimental and, and actual wildfires in Washington. And the experimental fires had a neutral to positive effect on stems. Um, there was a short term negative effect on above ground biomass and production. And studies showed that long-term, um, long-duration smoldering on the mats had a more damaging effect. Um, of the three fire sites that were studied, um, sprouting was vigorous, except in one site where the forest cover by trees had started to uh, um, occur. And so there was um, significant heat from, from the conifer trees nearby that consumed um, the litter and also crept into the heather communities. Response to climate change. Uh, so in the book, um, the plant guidebook, um, Alpine Plants of the, uh, North, of the Northwest by Pojar and McKinnon, uh, climate change is briefly covered and projection, projections of climate change and its impact in the Northwest are fuzzy. And that's due to complex topography, um, climate processes, 
in our subalpine regions have high levels of uh, variations that are related to atmospheric circulations and ecological gradients. So what does that mean? Um, they say in order to consider what would happen at higher elevations during the century, when we must consider uh, local topography and how that is influenced by climate or how climate influence, or yeah, excuse me, how local topography influences the climate, um, how climate um, variations play a role such as El Nino and how moisture and eleva uh, elevation gradients play roles in species distribution. So we need to consider climate variations, which are short term and change, which is long term. And this is Wing Lake off of um, Heather Pass. And um, just a pretty picture to break up the, the presentation. Pojar and McKinnon note that projections of temperature change have greater certainty than projections of um, precipitation change. So that means that the um, expansion of moist, temperate coastal and interior conif conifer forests will move upslope in, in, into northern expenses um, at the expense of um, subalpine forests. So two major points to consider when um, projecting ecosystem trends and, e and impacts is that um, um, ecosystems will not move up as a whole um, into suitable habitat. It's a species individually that will move up. And some species will stay put while others will migrate upwards to suitable habitat. Um, so the major determinants of heather distribution are elevation and the duration of winter snowpack. So um, decadal predictions say that we will have warmer and wetter winters and progressively warmer and drier summers. So that ultimately decreases snowfall and snowpacks um, and changes the locations of where those would occur. So what does this mean for heather? Um, slopes typically remain snow covered from mid-October until late June. Um, and species at lower elevations, such as the Philodicy and Petroformis, um, the Pink Mountain Heather and the Cassiope martensiana, the Western Moss Heather, will need to move upslope. Um, that could have an effect on the Heather species, such as the Western um, Moss Heather that depend on winter long snow coverage. Um, it could also have an effect on the slow growing um, seedlings of the Heather, um, of Heather species because they, they need to establish on those ridge tops and fell fields where moisture is already a limiting factor. Okay, so what can you do um, to help uh, protect these Heather communities? You can get involved, um, volunteer. Um, the Forest Service is always looking for volunteers to sign up with the district and hike these trails um, to, to inform the public, not necessarily to police, um, but just to inform and, and talk about the Heather communities and um, how special they are to us. Um, and also, you can keep informed by following the Okanagan Wenatchee um, National Forest on Facebook. Okay, questions, comments, or concerns? All right. Hey, Kelly, thank you so much for the presentation. That was super informative, really great pictures, including this one. Um, we do have several questions um, that I want to take the time to get to if you have the time to answer them. Um, and I think what we can do if you want, you could stop sharing your screen and then, but then it would just be, well, that's fine. It's the four of us. That, that'll do, that'll be perfect. And then that way, if um, if there's any skipping or anything, it'll just, you know, the internet will work better. <laughs> okay, so the first question that we had, um, 
is so for the maple pass loop is there um does the forest service require any permitting in order to hike to through to through hike the loop no no we don't okay cool so that means there's um you know there's not really a limit to use or anything at this point not at this point okay cool um so you talked a little bit about um about the astounding amount of time that it can take for a heather community to mature um i was curious how long does it take to grow a transplantable heather plant in the greenhouse it took three seasons to grow a stable a stable plant that was robust enough to withstand the um the transplant and then you know the greenhouse is much different than the subalpine habitat of the um, heather and maple pass so i mean there's also about a 50 percent survival rate for those transplants but we're seeing a pretty high um survival rate it's, it's more than 50 percent okay so for those of us that don't um you know, that don't really know, is 50% pretty high? Like are other species quite a bit lower? Like how does that compare to other um, kind of perennial species? I would say that 50% is pretty low. If I'm going to put a plant in the ground, I would want to have a better survival rate than 50%. So I, um, reading through the literature, I would say that it's a pretty low rate. Okay. Okay, yeah, I mean, the restoration stuff that I've worked on has been like a lot of grasses and they tend to ha have like a really much higher, you know, rate than that, but I just wasn't sure if that was standard or if that was special for grass. So, uh, let's see, we have a couple questions from the audience. Nathan's got a couple questions for you. Um, so when, so he asks, and and I might, I might need, perhaps you'll be able to understand his question a little better than me, but he's curious if the heather was layered to propagate it. Does that make sense to you? And then I should think says, about that. Yeah, he says, can you speak about propagating the lime haters at all? I'm also not super sure what that means. That might be something that if Nathan is still around, maybe he can check that out and get back to us on that. Okay, um, let's see. I believe you answered Nathan's question about why rolled leaves are important for pink heather and that has to do with decreasing the surface area uh, of the leaves, which decreases the water evaporation. Um, have there been any studies that look at the lichen communities uh, that are associated with heather communities? Yeah, you know, there's there are big um, lichen monitoring efforts going on in the um, wilderness areas. Um, and so I would say that the uh, some of those monitoring areas are in the heather um communities cool. and what was what, yeah what was the i can you um say your question again yeah <clears throat> excuse me have there been <clears throat> have there been any studies looking at lichen communities on the founding rocks of heather communities hmm. other than measuring air quality um, of the lichen um, and how, how air quality affects lichen. I don't know um, if there has been. Yeah, I feel like there's been a lot of research lately on lichen communities, but I think it would be potentially a really interesting project to look at, uh, about, at lichen communities and the interaction with, with you know, really long lived plants like heather. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Lindsay is wondering, um, 
Lindsay says, it's very impressive to see how much goes into the Heather restoration at Maple, Platt, Maple Pass. And she's curious if there are plans to do similar Heather restoration efforts amid the increasing number of fire, fire pits at Wing Lake. Yeah, we looked at Wing Lake actually as part of this project. And um, man, you know, that area is just, um, it's so popular amongst um, climbers. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, some of these areas, in order to maintain um, and preserve some of these areas, I hate to use the word sacrifice because that's not a good word to use when you're looking at um, restoration. Um, but, but we can't close it all off. And yeah, I've been into Towing and Lewis Lake Falls and, um, and I've seen the effects of, of um, the, the camping and the user created trails. Uh, right now, logistically and, and, and uh, fund funding wise, unless we have another um, onslaught of private donors that wanna donate to, to Wing and Lewis, like um, I don't see that happening in the foreseeable future. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's understandable that, you know, there's, there's like countless number of areas that that could use restoration efforts and very in like limited funds. So yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, my husband has a question for you, Kelly. Um, he is an avid backcountry skier. And he's skied in some of the areas that you mentioned today. Um, and Dave wants to know if skiers can negatively impact Heather communities by compacting snow or if or if the fact that they are recreating on top of snow provides some sort of cushion to the impact on the plants right yeah if you're if you're on top of the snow and as long as you're not post holing um, down and and stepping on the the mats the heather mats um, that's ideal yeah, it's 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 that tricky time of of um, you know late uh, the late season snow melt where you're trying to navigate. You're, there's not snow to to step on, and you're trying to navigate. And it's and uh, that's usually when we're seeing the the user created trails um, being established. Thanks for your concern, Dave. That's a good question. He gives a thumbs up. <laughs> Um, okay, and just I believe unless anybody has any other questions they'd like to add to the Q&A, we just have one left, and it's from me. Um, I'm kind of curious, you, you talked a little bit about um, fire impacts on Heather communities. Uh, I am wondering, what is the natural um, historical fire return interval for some of these areas? Yeah. It's going to be a longer return interval because of how high in elevation they are, uh, and just the the plant associations and um, yeah, just the natural return interval would be um, pretty long. That makes sense, especially at such high elevation. Um, and then we actually did just in the nick of time. We got a little bit more clarity from Nathan from his earlier question about propagation. Um, he says, it looks like the cuttings in your photos were taken to start the nursery crop. Uh -huh. uh, how were the nursery plants started and were there any special methods that you needed to consider while growing in acidic soils? Yeah, all of that was taken into consideration. I'm just going back through. Yes, yeah, so the, the cuttings, um, the cuttings were, the plants were propagated um, by cuttings. And I don't have the ins and outs. I wish I did. I, I wish I was there when all of this was going on. Um, Stacy McDonough at the park is awesome to talk with. She is just a, a wealth of knowledge about propagation, especially in subalpine plant communities. Um, They've done a lot through the park and um, and yeah, she would be a great resource to ask. I 
yeah, I wish I could have been there through all of it, but I wasn't. And I'll have to research that, Nate. Yeah, um, it's. I can only imagine what it what it would take to propagate uh, the number of plants and this the type of plants that they did. And um, I know that the folks at the at the greenhouse there at the park are just totally pros. So uh, I think that's all that we have for questions. Um, so I just want to. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much again for taking the time to present to us tonight. It's just been really wonderful to learn about, um, you know, Heather as a group of species and, um, and the restoration efforts that you're doing up there. Uh, I also want to do a quick shout out to our chapter members that came tonight and then also our non-chapter members and guests of the Washington Native Plant Society. I see lots of folks that are from other chapters out there, um, including Kelly's chapter uh, up in the Okanagan. So we're glad you could all make it. Um, and thanks to Denise for helping us troubleshoot and getting this all set up. The state, the state organization really helps um, helps us get these virtual programs going. Um, so thank you so much, Kelly. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Sorry about the technological snafu there. <laughs> no worries. It's uh, it happens. It happens to the best of us. It's hard to tell how these things work. So, <laughs> thanks for your patience and thanks for sticking with it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly. It's great to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you, Connie. Okay. Okay. I'm going to stop recording.